So, hey, this is Julie Petra. It's Thursday night. I'm here for my Thursday night talk. Welcome. It's Thursday. And the topic I want to talk about today, actually, let me back up a little bit and give that little summary. So I love to talk about something I call Petronomics, which is my 10-part strategy to grow, protect, and transfer wealth. Today, we're going to talk about sending your dollars out and having them come back as with friends. That's what we talk about. Or that's what I say when I talk about investing. It also includes some of the snack now feast later part, which means you can't spend everything you have because you have to save it to do something with it later. But we're going to talk about several major life events, retirement, college for kids, um, your bucket list, getting married, anything that requires a large sum of money that you need to save for or plan for. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so let's talk about planning for major life events. Let's say retirement. And I would love to get some feedback. I'm just going to say that up front. I would love for someone either in chat or just to say, how much do you think you need for retirement? A million, I guess. I don't know. At least a million. A million dollars. Okay. Thank you, David, for offering a number. Shantae, did you have something too? I would say three to five million. Three to five million. Okay. So now I want to back that up a step and say, how much income do you wish to have a year? Oh, Joel said 10 million. Okay, Joel. <laughs> but um, how much money would you like to have in retirement per year? So if you had a pile of assets, it can be money, it can be stock, it can be real estate property, doesn't matter what it is. If you had a, a million dollars and that money made pretty consistently 10% a year, so it's like an annuity that makes 10% a year, then you would have $100,000 a year. So let's think about that. If you had a million dollars and that money made 10% a year pretty predictably, then you would have $100,000 a year. So can anybody tell me what happens if your money doesn't make 10% a year, but it only makes five predictably? How much money do you need to have in those assets, if you're making 5% of your assets to live at $100,000 a year. Well, then I'm gonna tell you, that's $2 million. The formula basically is whatever you want to make a year, you take the size of your assets, so if it's 1 million, it's 1 million, and you divide it by your predicted return. So 10% would be, of course, 0 0.10. So you divide a million dollars, sorry, multiply it. You multiply a million dollars times 10%, you get $100,000 a year. If you take $2 million, multiply it by 5%, you get $100 million a year. Now, there's an important concept that a lot of people don't think about when they look at the returns their money is making. And that is inflation. So when people talk about future dollars or real uh, today dollars, they're talking about allowing for the impact of inflation. Inflation historically has been considered to be about three to three and a half percent a year. Inflation in the past two years has been a lot higher. If you go by the stake index, so two years ago, when I was looking for a ribeye steak at Tom Thumb, it was between $12 and $15 a pound. The last time I bought a steak from Tom Thumb, it was $24.99 a pound. Now, thankfully, not everything has increased across the board like that. But if you allow for inflation, even if you take it to be 3.5%, so you take that 10% a year that you're hoping to make, you back off the 3% a year of inflation, that means you're effectively making 7% on your money. So if you have a million dollars and you're making an effective 7% on your money, 
you're making $70,000 a year. And that's it. Now, if inflation starts going up, and this is a real good time to start staying on top of what those numbers are predicted to be, you have to back that off your return on your investment. Now, I'm going to tell you that most people don't see 10% consistent return on their assets. There is a rule of thumb that the stock market has made some number between 1930 and now, and I think it's about six and a half to eight percent. You back um, inflation off eight percent, you have five and a half percent. Is that right? Yeah, five and a half percent. Hold on, four and a half percent. You have four and a half percent return per year. So if you have a million dollars, you're making the equivalent each year of $45,000 a year. If you look at what your house payments are, what your taxes are on those house payments, what your bills are, if you want to travel, if you take into account any of that, a million dollars does not look like a lot of money to last a lifetime, particularly if you want to transfer wealth to the next generation. So let's look at what Joel said. Joel came up with $10 million. That's what he says you need to have as investable assets to be prepared for retirement. So if you've got a typical stock market fund and those vary, keep in mind, you might get 20% one year, you might get 2% the next year. So you're looking for an average. Let's say your stock market portfolio performs over 20 years at 8% per year. You back off your... Um, your uh, inflation, and you're looking at about four and a half percent in real terms a year on $10 million. How much is that? Can someone tell me? It's $450,000 a year. I don't know many people that need that much money per year to retire. So this is when you start optimizing you shoot for trying to decide how much you need. Financial planners are supposed to be really good at this. They will tell you, well, if you're not working, you don't have to spend as much money on gas. You don't have to spend as much money on X, Y, Z. You can actually live on, let's say 60,000 a year. Some people, of course, are gonna think they need more and some people are gonna think they need less. But I'm gonna use 60,000 because if we average inflation out, say over the next 10 years, and you're looking to retire soon, it's probably going to be near 4%. So your asset would have to be earning 10% if it's $1 million to get you $60,000 a year, taking off 4% for inflation. That's if you have a million dollars that is earning $1 million on it. So, or sorry, 10% on it. So what kind of returns, what kind of strategies earn 10% a year predictably? How many of you know how much your 401k is making year over year? How many of you know how it's invested? Just show of hands, how many of you know what percentage of your 401k, if you have one, is invested in growth funds, is invested in more conservative stocks, is invested in, invested in blue chip. How many of you know and can just say that off the top of your head? Not asking for the information. How many of you know? So if you don't know, you really have no idea how much you're making or even going to be making. So there's a rule of thumb. When you're younger, be more risky to get the big gains. The closer you get to when you need that money, you go more conservative those are lower returns. And then about the time you retirement, you retire, that's the interest rate you consider going in perpetuity to provide you the income to live. Now, I have talked to people that have told me, well, I'm going to get Social Security. Has anybody ever thought about looking up how much Social Security is going to give you once you turn either 59 and a half or 62? Let's say you've worked your whole life for a W-2 job and you want to get Social Security and you've made, I don't know, $100,000 a year. If you were to put that into a Social Security calculator, and I don't know, I haven't looked at it, but I'm guessing they're going to give you between $1,500 and $1,800 a month. Now, if you're living in a house 
that say has like here in Texas, our property taxes are about 16,000 a year. Social security doesn't even pay for property taxes, let alone maintenance, let alone utilities, let alone food, let alone any kind of a life. So the one thing I wanna to talk to you about, and this is true with Petronomics, if you have a long-term goal and retirement is one of them, you need to start planning. I don't want you to panic if you haven't started now, but I would like for you to think about what can I do? How can I jumpstart this? And I'm sure many of you know someone who has made a lot of money, a lot of uh, focuses on, um, let's say professional athletes, celebrities and lottery winners. They get these large sums of money and for some reason within a short amount of time, they're broke, even though they've had millions and millions and millions of dollars at their disposal. They didn't keep them. They didn't put that money to work somewhere so they could come back later with more money. One of the things I do is I invest in real estate. So here's an example of something that I like. Let's say I wanted to buy an automobile and let's say it was a really expensive automobile. Let's say it's hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'm going to use some rough round numbers or hundred thousand dollars for the automobile. And they tell me, well, if you go get this automobile and you get an eight year loan, these loans are getting really long. Then it's going to cost you $10,000 a year in payments to pay for this $100,000 automobile. Now that may not be adding up right. I don't care. It's not the point. The point is if you put your lump sum of money into that car, you've now taken your money that could be earning you money and you put it into a depreciating asset. What I advise is you take that money instead of putting it into the car, you put it into an income producing asset, hopefully enough income to pay for the car. And that asset is, is paying you a return in perpetuity long after you've paid off the car. In fact, you can put that money in this asset, purchase this car, pay off that car. When you're done paying off that car, turn around and use the same money to buy another car. So you can, you can think of real estate investing like this, okay? This is my paying for house, house. This is my paying for car, house. This is my paying for property taxes, house. This is my traveling to Mexico and Jamaica, house. This is my funding my um, daughter's wedding, house. You see what I mean? It doesn't have to be a house, but it should be an asset. It is definitely important for everyone to start thinking of what assets do I have in place that generate income so that if I decided to just take a month or a year off, I've still got money coming in. I don't have to go to work. Like by work, I mean for a corporation that is requiring my time at a certain time or to a business that is requiring my time at a certain time. I want everyone to start thinking of, if you haven't already, what are assets I can put my money in that I have now that I can accumulate over the next years and continue to put more money into that, that in the future will let money come back to me. Passive income, mailbox money, whatever you want to call it, what it tells you, what it gives you is freedom. It gives you choices. So let's say you're going to work for a job that you don't want to do anymore. So a lot of people have, they're like, oh, I'm so tired of this job. I'm so tired of these people. I don't want to go. My boss is driving me crazy. But you have to go for the income to live. Imagine how different that decision process would be if you had, say, let's say six houses, one that pays your mortgage, one that pays your property taxes, one that pays for your car notes, the other pays for groceries, utilities, or whatever, and the other one pays for lifestyle. Let's say you had those assets, and then there were, you were feeling, oh, I just, I don't want to go into this job. My boss is a killer. The people are horrible, blah, blah, blah. What do you think the decision would be if you had that backup passive income, mailbox money, ongoing income? 
I would wager that then you would think I don't have to go because I have the freedom to do something else. And I'm going to back it up a little bit. In order to have that accumulation of money to put in an asset to generate income, you have to first be disciplined enough to accumulate money, which means you can't spend every dime that you make. You have to set something aside. Now, a lot of people, they contribute to their 401k. And depending on how much you make, that might be two, four, five percent, six percent of your income. Okay. That's not going to help you have enough to retire if you're starting at 40. You start at 21 and your 401k is invested properly, maybe so. But if you haven't done that, if you're starting, say, at 45, and you've only got a good 20 years until you're going to want to retire, you're going to need to do something a little more aggressive. So how many of you know what an IRA is? It? What an IRA is? Have any idea? Just for the people I can see, let me look at people on the screen. Just like raise your hand up. You know what an IRA is. Great. How many of you have IRAs? Okay, if you have IRAs, are, there, are they anywhere close to the amount of money you need between your IRAs, your 401ks, and your savings to fund retirement? I'm not talking about these other things you want to do, just retirement. Show of hands, how many have enough money to fund retirement already in some kind of vehicle? All right, then. So let's talk about that. I really, I'm not trying to scare anybody because no matter how old you are, there are steps you can take if you're willing to take it. So first let's look at a traditional versus a Roth IRA. A traditional IRA, those are the ones everybody hears about. The employer will tell you about them. You can pay, I think four to $5,000 a year before taxes. So it decreases your taxable income. You put that money in. You invest it wisely, one can only hope, and then it grows, 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 and by the time you get to 59 and a half, you can take distributions. Those distributions will be fully taxed. Or you can put your money in a Roth. That's not lowering your taxable income. You pay it what's called after tax, and you put all your money in, and you grow, 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 and then you can take those deductions, sorry, distributions tax-free. Or you have a 401k, that's a qualified plan. You contribute, contribute, it grows, grows, grows. You take those assets out in distributions and those are taxed. Now, there are vehicles, and I'm only gonna talk a little bit about this because I'm not a, C I'm not a CPA, I'm not a financial planner, I'm not an attorney, I'm not an insurance agent. I just wanna give you enough to go look at some things. So there are insurance products. I've had these pitched to me by four or five different people. It's a whole life insurance policy that you end up being the bank for yourself on the cash side of that life insurance policy. So there's a death benefit and there's a cash, um, losing my mind here, cash accumulation. Don't have the right word, but it doesn't matter. Cash value. So, cash value. Thank you, David. So you grow your cash value to a certain point, and then that basically becomes an annuity for you. Now, not everybody can do this because the insurance premiums are quite high, but what it does get you is um, an ability to use yourself as, at the, as the bank and generate money for your retirement. Insurance premiums at the moment and for the foreseeable future are protected from judgments. So if you're doing something that causes you to get in trouble in a lawsuit, they're not going to attach your insurance policies. I have a feeling the federal government, government has no such hold over that. They can take anything from you. But as long as it's a normal everyday type of judgment, those are protected and they're not taxable and they don't require or they don't cause a reduction or recalculation of your benefit for social security. 
That's what I've been told. This is not legal advice or insurance advice. Go check it out. But it is something to consider. So you can still get your little or little um, social security. It's not recalculated when you use this insurance product. And then you have a little bit more, more money to spend. Let me tell you about one of my strategies. I call it the 30 house strategy. I'm sure there are other words for it. But let's say you have 30 houses and each house has a 30 year mortgage and those mortgages are staggered. So let's say, let's say I'm 20 years old and at 50, I wanna start using this program. Well, at age 50, the first house has 100% equity. So I refinance that house with a cash out refinance. What's great about that, you can get 75 to 80, depending on the type of lending you're getting, 75 to 80% of the value of the house loaned to you. Now you're making loan payments, but remember this is an investment property. So you're getting paid to cover that mortgage. You take that, those loan proceeds and you can live on that. And it is not a taxable event. Let me tell you how many times you can do this. You can buy a house. Let's say it shoots up in value. You can refinance the extra money you get not taxable. You pay your equity, your um, leverage down, either if it's a rental house, somebody's paying that money down for you, you get a very high degree of equity again, you take another cash out refi, all that money comes to you tax free. You can keep doing that forever. And then, this is my understanding, you pass those assets on to your heirs they take it at the current cost basis, that is the value at the time it's passed through probate, if that's how you go. All of those accumulated refinances that you've done, it's like a reset. And then your heirs can start over with it again. Now, that's another way of using the cash value of something to have something tax-free. I'm gonna take a quick minute See if there are any questions. If you are in Zoom, please type a question if you have it. Anything that I said didn't make sense, please let me know. Or if you have any other question before I go on. In other circles, that's called income X. If anybody's ever heard that term. Basically, yep. um, as an example, that's what like Mitt Romney did. And mm -hmm. basically he cashed out or he, he refinanced his properties and he lived off of that income as he continued to pay off other ones. So after he spent that money, he could refinance the next one and continue to live basically tax free. Okay. So when people say that rich people have advantages, one of those advantages is really sound professional help to help you understand how to take advantage of, I won't call them loopholes, but advantages that you can take in existing tax strategy to avoid paying more taxes than you have to pay. If you're in another country, you have to seek somebody that understands more there because I don't know that much about other countries. I just know this one. And I know it's all about how do you reduce your taxable income and how do you have cash flow that comes into your pocket available for you to spend that's not taxable? Joel wrote, I have an index universal, universal life policy. Okay, thank you, Joel. You wanna tell me why you got that? You wanna share or you just want to put that right there? Is that a question or just a comment? We'll, we'll let that wait for a moment. Okay, so now when I've talked about retirement. I talk about it a lot because I know people that pretty much mortgage their retirement future to pay for their kids to go to college. I can't tell you how many people I've known that have done that. They've cashed in their 401k, they've gotten themselves in the debt, they've ruined their credit to make sure their kid got through college. So that kid comes out, they have a degree, they're probably not making as much money as mom and dad did. Mom and dad are mortgaged to the hilt. Tell me what happens six out of 10 times when mom and dad are mortgaged and kid is not making enough money. Anybody have an idea of what happens then? Kids default on their student loans. 
the person who has to pay that is the one who co-signed because the person who defaulted doesn't have anything. The co-signer is just as liable for it. I know of an unfortunate case where I was trying to help a woman find a house to live in, not to buy, just to rent. And she couldn't find a house to rent. She, her credit was destroyed. She went through a divorce and the son defaulted on the student loans. She was left with a double whammy of not having assets and having ruined credit. And she had a fairly decent job, but with ruined credit, she couldn't get, she just could not find the house that she wanted to rent. And with few assets, she couldn't put anything down toward the purchase of a house. Now, this woman was in her 40s. She felt like she'd done everything right. And that's what happened. And it's really sad, but that's what happened. Now, let's, let's consider something else. If you don't have your kid get loans, which is what I hear some people say, well, I don't want them to have loans. I will put my 401k into it and they'll take care of me later. Now, I'm not saying that every child is bad and is not going to do it, but if your child starts having children, that's a pretty serious financial burden. It's natural for them to want to provide for their children. If you're sitting there being needy too, and I'm not saying it's wrong that you did what you did as far as the intent, but now you've placed yourself as a burden for your child in addition to their responsibilities for their children. And those are the ones that are called the sandwich generation. And those are the ones that are suffering from high blood pressure, heart disease, all kinds of stress related disorders. So let's think about that before you do that. Don't put yourself into a position to have to depend on your kids when they're also gonna be taking on other responsibilities. I know the intent is there to do well for your kids, but just think a little bit long-term. Another thing I've seen people go into hawk for are weddings. I want to spend a little time talking about that. I know people who have spent 60, 70, $100,000 for a wedding. And most of the time, they did not have that cash sitting around. So what did they do? They ran up credit cards. They went into their retirement funds if they had it, if they started building a 401k or they spent money that could have gone for the payment of the house. Now, I got married in 97. I have a friend that got married, let's see, right before me. And I believe she spent nearly $60,000 for her wedding. I spent $5,000. And I loved my wedding. It was small. I had a dress made. It was very simple. There were 46 people, including the wedding party. My husband and I went to St. Kitts. Oh my gosh, don't tell him I forgot. Um, we went somewhere in the Caribbean for our wedding. Can't remember where it was, but it was pretty. Um, he paid for my engagement ring. And all of that we paid for, we didn't have any long-term debt. We didn't spend a lot of money not by the standards of some of the other people, but I would say all told we were about 11,000 in. That included everything that we paid for ourselves. So we kept it small. My friend that paid nearly $60,000 for her wedding, I think it was like in February or March. I got married in May. I think she got married in February, and March. By the end of that year, they were done. 60,000, boom, gone. I don't really know what to say about that. Um, it's not that I think you don't deserve the wedding of your dreams, but I think you need to weigh your dreams. Don't blow all that money on a one day thing when you could have that money on a multi-year thing, like down payment on a house or starting to pay for an insurance policy or put it into a stock, um, uh, stock portfolio and start investing anything other than paying for flowers and cakes and dresses and ice sculptures and stuff like that. So another thing I want to talk about 
is college education. I've alluded to it before. Most of the time when people start planning for college education, it's usually about year 10 in school for their children. And like, oh, we gotta start saving some money. And they've got at best two. And a lot of times the people who think, oh, I gotta start saving, what they don't realize is their income is so high that they are now out of the need-based category for financial aid. How does that, what, what do you do when you have to come up with the money either with cash or with loans to put your child to college? They've done everything right. They've gotten into the right school. What do you do? That's a good question. I would like to suggest that everyone that has a child, not those that you already have them, but at the time they're born, start thinking about their college education. Start putting a little money away. Start making sure that investment for them is in, invested wisely so that they have money to plan on attending school with. Now, when my husband and I started planning back when they were little, we were thinking 15,000, 20,000 a year for school for four years, that should be good. Well, it became clearly obvious that wasn't what our children were thinking. So my daughter's school and tuition costs about 90,000 a year. And my son's about 35. So we've got two kids in college right now. And guess what? We didn't qualify for need-based financial aid. So I am pleased that we planned and we got their college funds fully funded for their education. Now, because of how expensive their education is, we had planned to be able to put them through grad school. That's not gonna happen. They're gonna have to figure it out. I'm not going to mortgage our retirement to put them into grad school, but they are getting great educations right now. If they wanna go to grad school, I'll help them figure it out on their own. I paid for my own grad school, so I'm pretty sure they can. My whole point to this is when you have major life events that are going to be very cash intensive, it requires planning. You have to live beneath your, your means so you can accumulate money. And then you have to be proactive enough to put that money out in some investment vehicle so that it will grow and come back with more friends. And whatever investment vehicle you choose, you want to make sure you choose the most advantageous in terms of tax liability and asset protection. I don't think I've defined that yet. Does everybody know what asset protection or what I mean when I say asset protection? Does everybody know what that is? I'll take a quick uh, definition. Asset protection is the strategy that if you are for some reason sued, your assets are protected from the risky activity you're engaging in, which might result in a lawsuit. So I do real estate investing. It's considered a risky function. I have to inoculate, sorry, I didn't mean to hit that, inoculate assets from that activity. So if something goes wrong over here with the real estate world, it doesn't wipe out everything in the other world. That's what I mean by asset protection. You protect from judgment. That's the biggest thing. You protect from liability. So that's, that's the big thing there. Um, I also like to protect it in such a way that it's not clear what I own. I think you make yourself a top, a very large target when you start putting out there everything that you have, it's like you're inviting someone to come and get it. Now, not everybody believes me on that, and that's fine. Live the life you want. Just try to make it a tip of the iceberg thing. People see this part without knowing what's all down below the surface. So where was I going with this? Um, I was talking about college education. I was talking about weddings. Another thing that people tend to spend a lot of money on are vacations. 
your 25th wedding anniversary. My husband and I are coming up on 25 years. Unfortunately, we don't have a big trip planned. COVID still makes things kind of weird, but people do plan for our 25th or our 30th anniversary. We're gonna take a cruise to Alaska and then we're gonna go up to Greenland and whatever, whatever. And I'm like, they're talking about a 20, maybe $30, $1,000 vacation that they haven't saved up the money to allocate for it. And then it becomes something they pay for with credit. And then they've, they've wiped out future cash flows paying for something that they didn't save for. So there is a program, I can't think of it, but Navi Plan is one. Most um, investment advisors, financial planners use something called Navi Plan. You can also get a license yourself and you can put in, you can get, I think you can get a free trial. It's fun to try. You can put in all of these life events that you think are going to happen. You can put in what you think your retirement requirements will be. You can put in what your income is and what your net income is going to be. And it will spit out a very rough, but still useful estimate of how much you need at the point in time you decide you want to retire based on a certain rate of return in order to survive on whatever number of dollars you think you need a year. Sounds complicated, but it's, it's really easy. It's fun to have a look at your future like that. Put it in numbers and then get to work protecting yourself so that you have funds until the end of your life. You have to plan for the large dollar activities. Don't depend on your credit card to pay for them. Have some money, allocate money, plan for it, make it a priority. So you can have those dollars that you save from living beneath your, your means. And then you go out there and you put them in an asset or an instrument that's gonna have them come back with even more dollars. So you're prepared to take it to do whatever it is your goal says you want to do. Retire, pay for your kid's education, have a great 30th anniversary, take care of your health, pay off your house, whatever it is you want to do, make sure you plan for it. Okay, are there any questions? Hey, Eric, I didn't see you there. It's nice to see you. Does anyone have any questions? Because I've talked a lot and I would definitely like to get some input on some of the stuff I've said. Let's see if I need to go in another direction. Yeah, I was just asking, what was the name of that program you just said where you put in the different life activities and everything? So it's it's a, um, what do you call it? Um, financial planning software called Navi Plan. It's pretty expensive, but you can, at least you used to be able to get a free trial personal version and you could run your life numbers through that and then get an estimate of how much you need. Worst comes to worst, who all knows someone who does financial planning? Does everyone know? Okay. Um, you can go to any of the like American Express or TD Ameritrade. Any of those guys will have a financial planner. Usually you get one free consult if you deposit money in their funds. Or you can pay for them to do it. It's not that big a deal. Get them to run your numbers. Have your current bank accounts. Have what you think your income is going to be throughout the years. Have a plan on how much you want to live for retirement. So let's say I want to live on $75,000 a year. That's in today's dollars. If that's enough for you, then fine. If it needs to be more or less, you can take all of that information to a financial planner and they will come up with a plan for you. They might charge you a little bit for it. I remember the first time I had one of those done, this was a while ago, so probably like 18 years ago. We paid 150 or so, 200 for her to input all the information. And then she um, gave us a fairly rough plan. It's not perfect, it's just enough to start. Speaking of financial planners, I wanna share a story. So. When both of my kids were in diapers, my husband and I were out for a walk and we met this couple that were playing with their grandchildren. Got to having conversation. I was like, hey, you guys seem like you've been married a long time. What's the secret to a long lasting marriage? 
And the man said, um, respect your partner, take care of your money. And I was like, oh, take care of the money. He was like, money or stress about money destroys most marriages. I said, okay. Then he said, get yourself some good professional advice. Here's the name of our financial planner. So my husband was like, cool. We make an appointment. We go talk to this woman. And she tells us that basically we are not her kind of people. We did not have enough money and in investable assets to be her client. And that is when she recommended we speak to this other fee-based financial planner who didn't require that we place a lot of investable assets with her, just that we could pay her, hey, we need a financial plan. Hey, we need to ask you some questions. It was a fee-based thing. Um, and she used NaviPlan. And I experimented with three or four different, I'll have to come up with the names of those. I actually talked to some of the financial planning developers of some programs. It's worth it to dig into that a little bit to find out what you need to do to understand even how to create a plan. That is an exercise in itself. The point of the story is, if you're constantly educating yourself, you get to take better advantage of professional help. The woman that told us we weren't her kind of people, when was that? I'm gonna say that was 2004, 2003, 2004. And I think by 2005, with some hard work, um, when we were her type of client, we didn't need her, we needed somebody better. We were ready for the next step. And we, didn't start investing in stocks, I want to say until 2009. So it was after the, um, the debacle of 2007 and 2008. That's when we started investing in stocks. Um, we found a professional um, wealth advisor who was recommended to us by the people whose net worth portfolios we wanted to get to their level. So we, we found those people, we asked for their advice. We went to talk to that guy. And I think we've been there 10 years maybe. And he's been really solid for us. He's fairly conservative, but he gives pretty good returns on the investment um, that he handles. Plus he's been really good as a real estate mentor and helping with business planning. So he's He's a multi-use professional. If any of you want to seek a financial planner and want some help in deciding one, call me. I'll give you five minutes to kind of give you some guidelines. But another story, Julie's story, and this is with American Express. We walked in to talk to their investment advisor. This guy had on a nice suit, slick haircut, nice watch. I mean, just clean looking young man. And he was telling us, my husband and me, what we should do. And I was looking at him and I just said, stop, wait a minute. Do you own your own house? Do you have kids? Are you married? Do you have an investment portfolio? Can we see what your returns have been in the past five years on your investment portfolio? And he couldn't share any of that, so I got up and left. If there's anything you can learn from that, do not listen to people tell you what to do if they don't do it themselves. Listen to someone who's done it themselves and they're willing to show you, hey, this is what I've done year over year. Um, if this kind of return works for you, then we can form a relationship. So thank you for asking about that. Once again, that's Navi Plan, N-A-V-I Plan. You can Google that and see if they are still offering uh, a free trial. Um, if not, then text me. We'll figure something else out. Any other questions? Okay, I have another one. If any of you are married and live in Texas and have a 401k, this was some advice offered to me. I'm only throwing it out there because it's something I plan to look into. Um, this guy told me that it might be better to cash out the 401k and put it into the universal whole life, whole universe. What, what is that called? Whole life universe. Sorry, can't think today. And I'm like, hmm, 
hmm. At first I thought, no, but now I'm thinking, hmm. So if you guys talk to me next week, I will have checked that out to see if for me and my husband, it will be a good idea. Are you but, talking about an IUL? Yes. You, okay. And so that's an index universal index, life index, policy. Index universal life policy. Thank you. Which is totally different than whole life. Yes. I mean, the index universal life. Thank you for the correction. Mm -hmm. So it's something to consider. I don't know if we'll do it. I don't even know if it looks like a good idea if I can get my husband to do it because it's his 401k I'm talking about. But um, another thing that I heard about for people in Texas, if you're married and one partner has a 401k, there is a strategy that you can implement where you will lose your 10%, but you could basically hand your 401k over to your partner in cash. And you might choose to do something else. Now you got to make sure you see the right attorney about that. And it's not applicable for everybody. You have to be married and you have to be in Texas. I don't know if other states do it, so I won't speak to that. But I know that you can do that in Texas. I brought that idea to my husband. I was like, wouldn't you like to just liquidate your entire 401k and give it to me? And he said, no. So we won't be using that uh, strategy. <laughs> and he didn't even say, hmm, let me think about it. He was like, no. Okay. So you have to have the agreement from the spouse that holds the 401k. Um, another thing, oh, I can't believe I haven't talked about this. If you have minor children and you have other family members with assets and they don't mind donating some of those assets to your minor children, there is, and if somebody's Googling, I think it's 60 grand a year or 56 grand a year that they can donate tax-free to minor children, the Uniform Gift to Minors Act, or gift to, sorry, my brain is a little fried today, but look that up, gifting money to minors. You can gift to minors as well. Now, here's a couple of things that you have to make sure you stay on top of. If they're minors and they're getting the money, it is theirs. So you need to make sure that it's structured in such a way that they can't blow all of the money, that you set it up in such a way that it is protected until they're of age. But once they come of age, I'm pretty sure they then get it. You have to trust that your minor children will become adults that spend that money wisely because it becomes theirs. So, oh, one more thing I wanna talk about. Um, I have heard people say to me that they view their personal home as their retirement planning vehicle. That they plan when they retire to either take a reverse mortgage or pay it off and buy something else smaller and then have that lump sum available to live on. Can anybody tell me where are the points of fallacy in that plan? You're probably going to lose your house, especially if your house needs repairs. You're dumping money into repairs so you can forget about the equity. Um, and then also, where are you going to live if you do pull the equity out? Exactly. So this year in particular, when the real estate has gone crazy and people have gotten these wonderful gains or they have all this equity in their house and then they're thinking, okay, I'm going to sell my house and downsize and go where? Where will they go? First of all, if they have to, to a senior office. citizen, unless you're going to a citizen, senior citizen community, you can't go anywhere and live. <clears throat> Even those are getting hard to get into because there are people, there are lots of people who were thinking, oh, 2020, 2021, I'm going to downsize, go into a 55 plus community. A lot of those are getting multiple, multiple offers on those homes and they're getting more and more expensive. So what happens if you buy a house, say in 1990 for $300,000 and it appreciates, let's say you don't put much into it. But by the time you're ready to sell, I do know someone in a very similar situation, that house is worth one and a half million dollars. 
So you have $1,200 worth of gain. Who knows the limit on tax-free gain on your personal residence? $500,000 per person. I believe that's correct. So then you're paying taxes on 200,000. That's if it hasn't appreciated more. I have a friend that her house is worth close to two and a half million dollars now. It was one tenth of that 20 years ago. Now, if she sells it and puts pretty much all that money back into another house, then there's little to no taxable liability. But if she sells it and wants to move somewhere and live in something a lot cheaper, then she has all this unrealized gain that she now, or unrealized appreciation that she now gains and that she has to pay a lot of taxes on. So I told her, don't do that. Rent that puppy out. But before you do that, refinance, get most of that equity out in a loan let your tenant pay for it, use that money, and then buy yourself another property. She said she didn't want to be a landlord. And I said, okay. Then I stopped talking. Because at that point, what do you say, right? I mean, you don't want to be a landlord. I don't want to lose 50% of my money. So, But the problem with using your personal home as a retirement fund that if it appreciates greatly, there are protections for you not to pay taxes if you put it into another property. But if you elect not to do that, then see your tax strategist before you do it to protect it in the best possible way. That's all I have to say. Good points. Very good points. Is there anybody on here, just raise a hand, that's looking to retire in the next five years? I am. I don't know how. <laughs> okay, David, we'll talk offline about how. I don't think you're so much as ready to retire as you're ready for maybe a change. Would that be more appreciate? Or you're ready oh, to retire? Change is coming. Change is coming. <laughs> By retire, I mean that you're going to spend less than half time in some profession. But seriously, if you are looking to do that, the other thing I want you to think about is healthcare insurance. That's another one of those things that you should start planning for as soon as possible, uh, the cost of your healthcare going forward. And I'm sure you have something in mind. Well, I have a number of things in mind. Um, when you're younger is the time to start looking at, and when you're healthier, to start looking for long-term disability insurance, um, for long-term care insurance, or you can choose to self-insure. Now, this is a tricky thing. You're basically saying, what do I think are going to be my major healthcare concerns when I'm older. Most people who have very healthy parents don't really think about it. I, well, I won't say fortunately, but I have in my family, a mother that died at 57, a grandmother that died at 62 and a great grandmother that died at 33. So mortality has always been something that's been on my mind. So having assets to pay for some of my probable long-term and chronic conditions have been a part of the plan since I've gotten married. And also, I believe in living each part of my life to some kind of enjoyment. So while I'm prepared for later, I prepare for rainy days. I don't live by that. I live, hey, I still got to have some fun today because if life ended tomorrow, I've had some great days. But I'm going to encourage you that even if you don't have a family history of early mortality, think about it. What happens if you contract cancer? It's very expensive these days. Oncology, 
wow, those guys make a lot of money for good reason, but that's a lot of money. And then recuperative care, um, a lot of stuff is not becoming covered by insurance companies, so it's out of pocket. You have to really shop your long-term care providers, look into some healthcare alternatives, and try and be healthier, try and eat healthy, try and stay relatively stress-free so you don't get those stress-related illnesses as much. But I don't have, I can't say that I'm a wonderful expert. We've got some things in place. Um, if I were to contract cancer, I think we're prepared. That's kind of what I'm thinking of. My mother and my grandmother, my grandmother's on both sides, contracted cancer. My great-grandmother died of an aneurysm. I don't know. So she didn't have a lot of long-term care requirements. She was here today and then gone. Unfortunately, she left behind several young children. So when my children were young, that was very much a concern of mine. Now that they're 21 and almost 20, I'm like, ooh, y'all set. You know, but when they were kids, I had thoughts about it. Um, there was something else I just mentioned that I wanted to say more about. What was that? We were talking, I mentioned, what did I just talk about? Can someone rewind? Transcript? <laughs> what? <laughs> what did I just say? Let's see. Health healthcare, insurance. Insurance. Um, um, Long-term care, cancer. Senior yeah. housing, oh, retirement. Yeah. Retirement. Yeah, I was talking about um, when you're thinking about your children. And I wanted to get to this. So let's say that you have very young minor children and you want to provide for them financially. And you're saying when we if we were both the past, we want X, Y, Z person to watch out for their finances, et cetera, and so on. Please don't also forget who you want to use or have take care of them emotionally, who's going to raise them and have the values that you want to impart to them so they become the kind of people that you want growing up that may or may not be the same person that you want to entrust the money to. In the case of my husband and me, they were not the same people. So there was a custodial and then a financial trustee for them. Feel free if you have questions to post them in the Pitronomics group. Um, Eric, you're in the group, right? I think I saw that you joined. Yeah, I'm in the group. Okay, so if you have any questions, it's great to see you. I know we've missed each other a couple of times. If you have any questions about this or any other topic related to Pitronomics, you can private message me or you can put it in one of the, the um, comment sections of a post. Thank you guys for joining me. I really appreciate that. And if there's no more, then I'm going to say good night and I hope to see you next week. Mm -hmm.